know that you're still learning, that this has not shut you down, that you are still figuring this stuff out together. Uh, it's, I love the, the posts and the encouragement has been one of the coolest things about this time where we are social distancing is that people are still trying to show up in unique and different ways. And for me, the creativity and all that is, is mind blowing. So share those hashtags, tag us, and uh, we'll see you online too. All right, so first we'd love to participate in the chat box. It's really important that during these uh, Zoom meetings and during these different meetings that we're, that we're experiencing today, that we get involved. I think it's easy to sit on these and then just kind of tune out. So we, we need to jump into chat boxes. We need to engage, have conversations as best as we can. So answer a couple of these questions, your name, your responsibilities, the number of virtual employees that you have or that you oversee, how long you've been in your current position. Um, we'd love to hear that in your chat box. So jump on in, check it out, see who else is here. Uh, network, that's what this is about. We're just gonna do it uh, in a digital space. So yeah. So when we talk about a virtual team, I think it's easy to uh, maybe be unsure about what that means. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, Obviously, it means that we're physically separated uh, at a time or distance. Now, I, this isn't anything new. I think a lot of times we think uh, that this is a new problem to have or something that we've not experienced before, but we've had distance teams. We've had people working from distant locations, door-to-door uh, -door salesmen, uh, people in ancient Greece and Rome who were uh, collecting taxes at the docks or working outside of the actual traditional business, uh, this is typically more normal than maybe we give it credit for. We're just having a different space digitally that maybe they didn't have when they were doing door-to-door -door sales or remote sales teams. So I do think that it's interesting how they were able to keep connections, calling into the office, um, stopping in um, when they're way, way back through town. So I do think that this is an interesting dynamic that is a twist on kind of an old issue, an old problem. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, this idea of communication and that primarily electronic uh, is tougher whenever we're talking about emailing back and forth or texting or using Slack or using any of these different devices, we can kind of lose something. So that's why my question would be, how are virtual teams different from traditional teams? Now you can answer these questions I'm gonna throw out in the chat box, you can answer them for yourselves, you can take notes, it's, it's really up to you. Um, I think that we find a lot of differences with virtual versus traditional is we didn't really have this type of technology growing up. I'm not gonna assume anyone's age, but my age is I had a computer I could use at school, maybe on Friday for 20 minutes if we were good, right? And even then it was to, to find where in the world was Carmen San Diego. It, was, it wasn't for any type of uh, business or uh, official usage, really. So for me, this idea of virtual is still fairly new because if we didn't grow up using it, we're still figuring it out. We are digital immigrants to this. We are still trying to work out how do we act like a cohesive team online? How are we not, how are we, I mean, I, I checked my email in high school once a month, right? And now I have a hundred emails every day. That's not more efficient, that's less efficient if we have a hundred emails a day. So how are we able to communicate virtually in unique ways so that we're not just going, oh, I'm gonna do what I would do in person and just transfer it all online. That's not being innovative with our, with our businesses. So I do think there's, some differences between our teams in person and our teams virtually, but I still think there's some ways to go with innovation in that. All right, so then why virtual teams, why use them at all? If we're unsure of how to use them maybe efficiently or effectively, why do we need them? Well, we need them because we have this global economy, this global market that we have to show up to. We have to be aware of, we've got to sell on, we've got to communicate on. So it's really important that we figure this out in better ways. We wanna be able to conduct business from anywhere at any time, 
and we really want to use the most qualified people. And they may not be people that live in the same city. They may not be people who live down the road or work at certain companies. So for me, we really want to make sure that we add our talent pool from around the world. That's really impressive. Um, I know in my business, I sometimes use different, uh, uh, I use my graphic designer lives in Chicago. So it's really helpful to be able to have all these different options for us. It also can keep costs down if we're not having to have a giant building with, with electricity and all this energy that we're using. So that can help. Uh, we can ensure that, again, like we said, the best talent is conveniently located because they can actually respond to the marketplace close to them, not necessarily close to us. Also, it gives uh, my dogs more time with their roommate. Uh, I get to spend more time with, with the things I love and the balance I enjoy. And also, right now, why virtual teams? It's kind of our only option. It's not like we can just roll in to, to do what we need to do. I do a lot of consulting for schools and school districts, and we're shut down right now. So right now, my only option is to be virtual. So many of us who maybe didn't choose it right now, it has been thrust upon us, and so now we have to navigate these waters that maybe we weren't planning on navigating. So there's different types of virtual teams, right? We've got uh, the in-person, which is people who typically reside in the office, but they can work from home if need be. But then you have the virtual team. These people work and reside from home 80% of the time or more. We also have what we call the COVID-19 virtual teams, which they have to do it out of necessity because of the stay-at-home orders right now. So we're gonna to try to talk about each individual ones as we go along, but I want you to think about which one are you? Where do you fit into this? Do you, do you, are you a COVID-19 virtual team? Uh, are you a virtual team all the time? Are you an in-person who just occasionally works from home or a remote location? Where do you fit and then where do you wanna fit? Where do you see the future fitting? I think those are some interesting questions to start thinking about as we move on today. I'm gonna occasionally stop just for my coffee. All right. So leading virtual teams, there is obviously a, a challenge in doing this, right? Whenever we have to lead a team on site, there's a sense of presence, there's a sense of culture, there's a sense of, of, of casual communication. These things that maybe can be really important non-verbally, right? They help us move into this. There's something different about sitting at my desk. I had to come into my office, in my house, and sit at my desk to do this. If I sat, if I laid in my bed to do this, it would be different. So there's something about the mood and the culture that is important. And a lot of times we have that on site. So some of those problems that we have can be uh, that very thing. I would ask you, what have been the challenges since quarantine? What have been your challenges through working virtually? This is what that, that chat box is for, right? What's the challenges on you? What have been the challenges on the team? Um, what have been the challenges on uh, the organization, the effectiveness? Have you been more effective? Have you been less effective? I do think, and, and this is my opinion, I do think sometimes we are a little less effective right now in this COVID-19, uh, we're less effective only if we are at all. It's only because we're also at-home teachers. <laughs> we're also helping our families uh, figure out how to navigate this. There's also an overwhelming uh, feeling of confusion about what the future holds and the unknown, and that can be a little debilitating. So if we do see more challenges during this time, I, I would actually ascribe to those. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe you have a different opinion, but that is just what I'm thinking and what I've been experiencing and feeling myself. Every Sunday night I do a, a question answer about parents who are working to educate their kids and, and asking them what issues they're having. And it there's a lot. It's it's hard. So yeah. So let me just talk about mental health for just a real quick second, because right now mental health is a very important issue when we talk about working from home or working remotely. It's an issue 
regardless of the quarantine, right? It's, it's an issue normally as well, because we can start to feel isolated from our team. We can feel isolated from others. We can feel like we don't really belong to the company we're working for or the people we're working with. So some of the ways that we combat that are things like sticking to a schedule, getting up, showering, getting dressed, doing that every day, the same time we would if we went somewhere, I think can kind of keep you in this mode of, I've got stuff to do, I'm going to work, I'm going to get things done. And that, when you have something to work towards, you are less likely, statistically, to feel unsure, to feel depressed, to kind of wander in this nebulous of meh. Also, that's a technical term by, by the way, meh. <laughs> uh, engaging in consistent check-ins. This can be digitally or physically. Uh, I'm sorry, not physically, sorry, visually. Digitally or visually. So that can be things like uh, emails, calling on the phone, FaceTiming. I always recommend anything visual like the Zooms or the FaceTime because there's just something about, or Duo, if you don't have an iPhone, I don't want to, you know, uh, segregate anybody or be prejudiced at all. So whatever it is, but this face-to-face -face where you can see expressions, you can hear the volume of their voice, the tone, you're seeing how they're interacting. I find that to be incredibly valuable. Now, I also think we have to be careful because there can be so many check-ins that it becomes almost obnoxious, right? Where we have so many Zoom meetings, so many of these things that it can be overwhelming. So, but making sure that it's consistent. Every morning for 15 minutes, we do a check-in. Something consistent, I think, helps with that mental health, knowing that somebody's checking on me, I matter, and that's important. I, Adam Brooks, I actually live alone. I, I don't live with anybody else. I'm, I'm bachelor padding it up. And so for me, when people call to check in on me, there's something that helps my, you know, my cortisol spike, um, that dopamine, that feel good chemical for me to be like, ah, oh, yes, I'm, I'm looked after. So yeah. Uh, taking regular breaks for physical movement. There's a great book called The Science of Perfect Timing. It's a brilliant book. And in it, they talk about taking 10-minute breaks throughout the day to go for a walk actually increases your productivity instead of decreasing it. You could work through lunch and work eight hours straight, and you would be less productive than if you took regular 10-minute breaks to kind of uh, go for a walk or go outside. So I think taking regular breaks is, is vital for our mental health. Also, boosting, um, we can boost our concentration with healthy diet. So eating healthy while we're in here. If we eat garbage, we start feeling like garbage. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit, it, I'm really into fitness. And when I say fitness, I mean fitness pizza into all this right here. So I, I do love pizza. I do love uh, eating comfort food when I'm feeling stressed. But I'm working really hard at trying not to do that while I'm in quarantine, while I'm at home, because it doesn't help my concentration. It doesn't help my mind work as effectively. Also, keeping a dedicated space for work. We talked about this a little bit ago. Going into my office to do work is huge. Um, for kids, having a separate place to do homework is vital. Having a separate place and saying that is the homework spot actually helps them know that when they sit there, I should be thinking homework. Same thing with us. When I sit here, I should be thinking work. So having a separate place. I have a buddy who's a writer for ABC, and what he does is he has a desk, and then he has a writing desk. And they're separate desks. And he knows when he sits in that one desk, that is writing time. So I think that's really interesting. All right, so leading virtual teams. By the way, let's go, let's go back here just for one second. If there's anything you think should be added to mental health, please write it in the chat, right? Um, if you think there's other things you can do, or, or let me ask you, what are you doing to keep your mental health during this time? If it's not on this list, add it. We need more things, right? All right. So leading virtual teams, what does it mean for a team to be high performing? What does that look like? What does that look like for you and your team and your company? 
And then what do you see as your role in creating a high performing team? What's your responsibility? Are you the leader? Are you uh, somebody who is in charge of virtual people? How are you able to make sure they're high performing? Are you able to? Or maybe that's why you're here today, to learn more strategies. These are really interesting questions because it's not just survival, it's high performing, right? It's not just how do we figure this out and meander our way through, but rather, how do we take what we're doing and take it to that next level? How do we actually give better work? How do we perform higher during this time? So, yeah. Here are some aspects and some characteristics. I'm gonna ask you to add some more to these as we go on. So we're gonna use this list throughout the rest of our workshop because we wanna to add to this of these characteristics of a high performing team. Things like an effective leader. An effective leader is somebody who communicates well, it's somebody who builds trust, which we're gonna talk about. It's somebody who ha keeps the vision and goals in front of the team at all times. Uh, again, the shared goals. Having a shared plan, those values are important. Finding the right people. The right people doesn't mean anyone, right? It means people who are willing to buy into that value, that goal, and follow that type of person. We're gonna talk about efficient and effective process, and then also uh, provide celebrations. For me, this is really effective because a lot of times we love workhorses. We want people who are just putting their head down and work, 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 work. And then we wonder why we lose them over time. And a lot of it has to do with this idea of celebration because celebration brings value, it brings importance, it brings trust. And we forget about that one key component because we aren't thinking about it. Sometimes I have to make notes and say, every day I'm gonna send a note to this person or once a week I'm gonna write this email thanking somebody or celebrating them in some way. I think that's a really important uh, piece. I think we usually focus on the efficient and effective processes, but we don't always focus on celebrations. We don't always focus on the shared goals and shared values. So we're gonna look at all of these today, but I think this is a great list, and I would ask you if there was anything you would add to that um, that you think is also important. All right. Another question, I know I'm asking a lot of questions in the chat box, but again, I think it's important for this discussion to happen organically. So are the same characteristics needed for leading a virtual team as they are for leading an in-person team? Is it different? That's my question to you. Are there things you would need for one but not for the other? So I, I think off the top of my head as I'm thinking, it, it, that's tough. I think we might have the same list, but we have to do some more than others. I think sharing values can be difficult when we're actually doing it in a screen type mentality. I think you can be creative and do it, but I think that might be a little tougher off the top of my head. Again, as you think of some of these, share them with everyone by adding them into the chat box. All right, this is the list again. So, again, these are the things that we're really going to focus on today, that clear communication, building trust, and promoting vision. Clear communication. I'm a, I'm a communication guy. This is a passion of mine. So I do think there are human needs of clear communication. There's also business needs of clear communication. There's this idea of mechanics and methods. There's meetings, there's personal scenarios. All of these are taking place, but they're all taking place now while being a homeschool teacher, a parent, an employee, a leader, sharing technology at home, your kid needing your laptop, your spouse working from the other side of the office that you're not on, or switching rooms. So clear communication is vital right now, especially. This is an issue in business in general, but now this is even more so important while we're actually working from home. As they slowly disappear. All 
Okay. So what are some human needs of people who are working virtually right now? Well, here's a few. They want to be heard and understood. I think that's pretty typical of most businesses. Respected and valued. To trust and to be trusted. It is hard, harder to trust and to be trusted than sometimes I think we let on. To be meaningfully involved in the discussion and related decisions. To feel supported in their efforts. Let me just tell you that second from the bottom, to be meaningfully involved in the discussion and related decisions. If you employ millennials, if you employ people who are, uh, what, 38 and younger, yes, this is even more so important, even more so, because we don't want to feel like a cog in the wheel, or, yeah, a cog in the wheel, or we don't want to feel like what we're doing doesn't matter. We don't want to feel like we are left out here on our own to figure it out, and that's how remote working can feel, that it's just, I get to it when I get to it, it's fine, and I'll work on it when I have time and in between commercials. But that means that we don't feel like we have meaningful involvement in discussions and related decisions. So let me give you a word of advice. Even if you're thinking about making adjustments, saying, hey, what do you think about this? It is going to be hugely valuable. They may say, no, eh, whatever you decide is fine. They may not have a dog in that fight. But the fact that you are actually asking their opinion, giving them meaningful engagement is huge, huge. So these are some important human needs. Sorry, I get a little passionate sometimes about communication. Uh, I'm not really apologizing, it's fine. <laughs> so what are some business needs of people who work virtually? Well, things like making decisions, resolving conflict, managing priorities. Again, knowing the vision or the plan, uh, accomplishing work from different locations and come to shared agreements. What's interesting about business needs, this idea of making a decision is oftentimes we are sitting in front of our laptop, our computers, and we're typing out an email and we are assuming that the other person is just sitting there waiting for our email, right? They're, they're not writing us back right away. And we're thinking, what are they doing? We know they're not going out. We know they're not out at a restaurant. So write me back. And so sometimes we have to have those conversations about, hey, I need this response by this amount of time, or we do our daily check-ins, things like that. So, so that can be a little tough sometimes when we talk about making quick decisions remotely. We know that communication, clear communication, has to do with what we call the, this is the transactional model. I have something I want you to understand, and I know you understand it by asking for feedback. We forget the feedback so many times. We deliver information and then we don't say, did, what did you hear? <laughs> what did you get out of what I just said? That's why our chat box today is important because it's about what do you understand? When I give instructions virtually and I send an email out and say, I need you to do these five things, asking for, what did you get? What are those five things I asked you to do? How are you gonna do that? Being able to engage in those conversations to make sure we're clear. Um, part of that is this being able to connect to the right person at the right time. Using video calls or regular calls can avoid any misunderstandings. It's asking for that feedback. Using voice and video communication tools. Sometimes uh, I know like in the, the, the department I am that I'm, uh, I, I help be a part of at, at Rio when we do teach online, we have a Facebook group that we communicate in all the time. Now, obviously for businesses, you may not want to do that, but you've got Slack, you've got instant message, you've got ways that you can communicate regularly so that you can make sure it's not just an email every five minutes, every five minutes, email, 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 email. I think it's really important to have multiple ways to communicate. So for me, that video or that voice call is kind of important. And maybe the only call they get, if they live alone like me, I don't get a lot of calls. So that might be actually really important for them to say, oh, you meant this. I've been going this other direction. So cut it off at the head and start communicating early and quickly and consistently. Meetings. So some challenges that meetings can pose when conducted virtually. Um, I think meetings virtually, this is a question for the chat box, right? Uh, 
what are some unique challenges in the meetings? Now, obviously, there's distractions. We can talk about the noise in communication and how things are easily distracted. I've got laundry going. I want to cook. I'm trying to figure out what my next meal is going to be, if you're like me. So there's other things you can do or get distracted by. There's also ways you're not sure you're communicating clearly, which is why those engagement of what did you hear me say? How does that work? Those are really important things in meetings that I think is interesting. Also, let me give you some advice. Sending out an agenda or sending out topics to be discussed 24 hours in advance is huge for online meetings. Because the problem happens is when you show up to an online meeting and it's like, well, what do you want? What are we talking about? Well, I've got this. And we aren't prepared. We aren't ready for that meeting. So that meeting takes an hour when actually that meeting could be 30 minutes, 20 minutes. So for me, I find that preparing people ahead of time is really important. Yep, participation and engagement, exactly. All right, so let me ask you a personal scenario. What human and business needs exist in you and your company or what you're working on now? What is the best method to communicate for you and your team? Think about other people's communication styles, right? How do they want to be communicated to? Maybe they like a formal email or a memo. Maybe they want a fax. Um, maybe they just want a text. Maybe they just want to be, they want to chat on the phone. If you have extroverts or people people, I would use FaceTime. I would engage them visually because that's something they're missing right now. Um, again, prepare for the meeting. Make sure that you are clear about the purpose and the importance. Make sure that there's facts of the situation that they should know, and they should get those ahead of time. Um, ideas plus questions to ask them. And then that's another way that you can increase participation, but how else can you increase participation and engagement? What do you think? What are you doing that's working? I did a little office karaoke on Zoom. Uh, where we all got on Zoom and we looked up different karaoke songs on YouTube and sang them to each other. And it was kind of a really fun team building thing. It was goofy. It was, but it was, it was great. It was something that kind of filled my soul for a little bit. So just throwing it out there. All right. So let's look at trust. When we're talking about trust, we need to talk about consistency because that is what happens. Uh, we love, uh, what is, what is her name? I have her book right here. Brené Brown. Brené Brown in her Dare to Lead book, she talks about how her daughter is trying to figure out how to trust friends. So she actually has a little jar. And Brené tells her, uh, each time somebody does something that's trustworthy, you put a marble in the jar. And once that jar is full, now that person is fully trustworthy. So it actually takes time to build trust. I love that image for me. It's, it's huge. Yep. We build it through empathy and we build it with sharing. So let's talk about sharing. Um, we can share rationale, we can share feelings, we can share ideas, we can even share emotions. We often talk about how we use our strengths to compensate for weaknesses. We talk about our vulnerability, our imperfections, things we're good at, things we're not good at. We talk about the lessons that we've learned. These are great ways to share with our team to build trust. So I might tell a team, hey, I'm, I struggle virtually because I'm such a people person. I just want to be there in person. I love moving. You can tell I'm moving my hands all the time. I get up. I'm really animated. I like to run around. So this is really restricting for me, and that might be tough. And that's a good thing to share with my team so that they know that if they're having a hard time, they're not alone. Now, that being said, I do think there can be some pitfalls with sharing right? We don't ever, ever, we call it appropriate self-disclosure. What's appropriate and what's inappropriate? Well, sharing confidential or personal information is obviously inappropriate. You could say, hey, John, John does this, or John's having a problem with this, but John never gave you permission to share that. So keeping that personal, keeping that private, that's appropriate. Focusing on the conversation, uh, you versus the other person. So the one-upping, right? 
sometimes that can definitely be a pitfall of sharing that everyone's just commiserating together. And now all of a sudden we have this uh, negative Nancy type. Sorry if there's a Nancy in here. I'm, I apologize. A negative person uh, uh, type feel to it, right? That's one of the issues is that we want to make sure that we're not just all getting on Zoom and all getting on virtual meetings and, and complaining all the time. That builds, uh, there, there's no positivity there. We're not building efficiency. So making sure that we're focusing on turning that conversation positive. Using only one method of sharing, when it's only one way, when it's somebody just venting all the time, but it's not a conversation, that can be a, a problem. Also, when you give unsolicited or unwanted advice. Here's a secret. I, wear, I will tell people, which hat do you want me to wear? Am I, uh, do you need friendly advice? No? Okay. Do you just need to vent? Okay, I'll put that hat on. Do you need me to listen? Do you need me to, you know, I ask questions about what that person needs whenever they are having an issue because that helps them trust me more. They know I can separate myself and say, I get it. Are you just venting? Do you want to vent for your, about your kids? Do you want to vent about being home? Do you want to vent about the work you're doing? That's okay, especially during this time. That's part of that mental state, that healthiness, right? So giving them a little bit of five, 10 minutes at the beginning of a conversation to vent might be a great way to do that, but you have to make sure you're saying, did you want to vent or is this what this is for? So as long as you set that parameter, you set that boundary, I think you're good to go. Um, but if you don't, that can be a pitfall because now they think every conversation they have with you, it's just going to be unsolicited or unwarranted advice or complaining all the time. So how do you build trust amongst the team and then between you and the team? Well, among the team, uh, again, providing meet and greet, providing uh, Zoom happy hours, providing time for them to get together and talk or getting them all in Slack together and asking them a question like, what's the funniest thing that's happened to you during quarantine? But providing some type of way to, to social network, instituting a buddy system. Having people connect, uh, mentoring. Everybody wants across every generation, one of the things every generation has in common, they want to mentor and to be mentored. Personalized e-cards, sending them, hey, I'm thinking about you. Sending a letter in the mail. Um, I encouraged uh, one, a principal of a school to start writing her teacher's uh, letters and putting them in the mail. What a great way to reconnect right now. Uh, informal phone calls, chats, texts. Again, depends on their type of communication style, but those are great ways to build trust in the team. But how about you? If you're the leader of the team, how do you build trust between you and the team? Well, performing your job effectively. If it's on you to do certain things, you better make sure you're doing it as the leader. People follow what they see. So we're looking for modeling right now. How are you modeling what we should be doing? Um, this can be to meet human needs, this can be to meet business needs, but whatever it is, make sure you are consistent with it. Also, acting with integrity, being honest, saying, hey, uh, I know you're struggling right now, but this is what I'm getting from you, this is what I need, is there some way I can help you get what I need? Um, how can we figure that out? So just being honest, being truthful, being real with your people. Keeping your commitments. So if you say you're gonna have a meeting every week, have that meeting every week. Make sure you set it at a time that everybody can meet. Keep consistent commitments. And providing recognition. Hey, I know this is tough, but I just wanna say thank you to so-and-so because you provided this stuff and that is crucial. You showed up every time for this and that's amazing. You're, you've got four kids at home and two laptops. You are killing it right now, right? Like providing recognition of what's happening. That can really help bridge that connection between you and them. All right, now we're gonna talk about the difference, embracing the differences. Not everyone is alike, so we have to be careful. I, just because I'm an, an extrovert, normally, typically, and I love going outside, I love coffee chats, I love going to nice restaurants. Not everybody's the same. So if I'm FaceTiming everybody all the time, that may not work. So how can you and your team Discover what makes each of you different. How are you asking them, hey, how do you want to be communicated with during this time that we're quarantined, right? 
during the time of social distancing, how do you want to receive information? That's actually a really interesting question that I don't think people talk about or think about until they're asked. Once we figure that out, we actually can be more effective. We can go to that high performing area because most companies, most leaders just assume everybody needs 35 emails every day, all week, all this stuff, but we don't customize it. We don't make it personal. We don't make it what that person needs and what they can do. So I think that's interesting. Also, how can your team leverage differences between trusting relationships? Just because we don't see eye to eye on things doesn't mean I don't trust them. A lot of times we put these together, but it's okay to have differences and still build trust. Know that you're going to do the work you need to do. These are great questions. So talk about them in the chat, give some suggestions. We wanna hear what you're doing to embrace these differences. All right, so if we look at our notes from this section or we look at our, our notes from so far today on building trust, what are things and ideas that you can implement with your team members? How can you build trust in your own personal scenario that you find yourself in? Share what you think in your chat, share what you're gonna do or what you found valuable and let's see what we can share. All right. We're going to look at promoting vision. This is our last section. So don't have a ton more time, just so you know. Uh, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? I love this. It's this idea of what's thinking before we're going, we're going to move. How can you keep vision top of mind? This has been a real struggle during quarantine because when this all happened, we rushed to kind of throw out the best ideas we had to throw out how to teach online, to throw out how to live, uh, operate online, but we didn't stop to think what's gonna be the best for the next three months of teaching online or, or being home with our family for the next you know, three months. So I do think this is a really great thing to close on. So some of the ways that we can keep vision top of mind is by providing things like vision and mission statements. We used to do in our meetings, uh, we would actually talk about our vision and mission at the beginning and end of every meeting, no matter what. That was just a way to keep that in the forefront of your mind. I think that's interesting. Maybe on the bottom of emails or whatever. Um, talking about clear expectations. How do they fit in this vision? How is what I'm doing fitting in this overall goal and vision? We don't want busy work. We don't want to feel like we don't matter. So that's really important. Easy to understand goals. Now, more than ever, we need to say we need A plus B equals C. Simple goals, clear, concise, compelling. We don't need these long-term convoluted crazy goals that are confusing or hard to navigate or hard to check in on if you're doing it. Um, regular progress checks. Again, checking in saying, how are you doing? Not micromanaging. That's not the same thing. But just saying, hey, what do you need to be successful? What do you need for the next assignment, for the next thing? Consistency, again, you're gonna hear this, consistent, consistent, consistent. Meetings, feedback, and communication. Make it consistent for everybody. Love that. All right, so we're gonna continue this. Uh, victory, celebrations. Now, victory celebrations can be formal. They can be formal like you send a box of donuts to be delivered to someone's house to say thank you. They could be formal like you are actually sending a certificate, showing it to them, presenting it to them online and sending them an email. But it could also be informally where you're just calling and saying, hey, I just want you to know you're doing a great job. I know this is hard. I know you might feel underappreciated right now, but you're, you're doing great. Um, a lot of our medical staff is getting this finally, right? We're saying thank you because of what they're able to do. So I think these celebrations can be formal or they can be informal, depending on what's best for you and your team. Um, the publicity of team accomplishments. Being able to say, hey, look what my team is doing during quarantine. Look what my team is putting out. Uh, that, that's associated to this vision or this goal. How is what we're, our output correlated to this? Um, Organization-wide updates on what you and your team is doing. And then also, again, structured approach to meetings. Having that agenda ahead of time so that we're able to make the most out of our meetings. That's huge. Um, having access to online calendars so that everybody can be on the same page and when things are, I think that's huge as well. 
um, that promotes the idea that my time matters and my time goes to the vision or the goals, not to busy work, which I think is really great. And then last is training on sharing tools like Google Drive or Dropbox. We don't know how long we're gonna be here, so using this time to train or talk about how do we move forward by being able to use these different online platforms, um, whether it's Google Drive or Google Share or Dropbox, or I'm using Google Teams, I learned about WebEx, I'm learning about Zoom, we're learning all sorts of different things, and so training right now could be great. It's huge. This is really a great time to be doing that. So the role of performance management um, is an ongoing, it's a, this communication between our leaders and our employees. We always want to keep our objectives and this idea of employee professional development at the forefront of any performance management. Right now, it's hard to evaluate. Are you doing this activity? Are you getting this work done? How well are you getting it done? That's difficult right now. But if we can keep our objectives, our strategies clear, and we're able to communicate those in a way that un makes sense to our employees, it's that much easier to see where they are exceeding and where we need more development. This is a great time to assess where everybody is at and how we can develop coming out of this or sending videos to be developed right now. There's a lot of great resources for development including what we're doing today. Um, again, the role of recognition systems, formal versus informal, recognizing your employees, I cannot say this enough, right now, recognizing them, giving them praise, giving them celebrations, goes miles, goes miles. People wanna be encouraged right now, not discouraged. There's so many other things out there that can discourage people. We need encouragement more now than ever. All right, so let me ask you, how can you keep your vision top of mind? Um, we like to hide that behind the small group activity uh, because it's bad vision, right? So uh, it's a pun, it's a joke. Anyways, uh, how can you keep your vision at the top of your mind? What are you doing for your team to keep your vision, your goals, your mantra? What are you doing? So again, We'll close with this. These are the characteristics of high-performing teams. What did you add after all of this? After talking, and I know I talked a lot, and I rattled a bunch of stuff off, but is there stuff you can add in this, or stuff you can see is vital for your team? Which ones are the most vital for you? Circle those, put those in the chat. Think about that. This is a list that we have to keep growing during this time. So I wanted to bring us back to that. All right. Now we're doing another poll. Um, now that we've reviewed key traits of high-performing teams, uh, which one do you think is the most effective? We talked about clear communication. We talked about, uh, oh, here we go. Effective leaders, shared goals, shared plans, shared values, the right people, efficient and effective processes, and celebrations. Let's let this poll go. I feel like I like an auctioneer. I got a record leader. I got, I, got, I got a shared plan. I got a shared plan. I got. <laughs> and I'm just watching them go up and down like that. <laughs> I know. I know. It's kind of like a race. Although it looks like effective leader is in the lead right now, closely followed by efficient and effective processes. Yes. I think effective and efficient processes is really interesting right now because of in quarantine, we're realizing some of our processes weren't in place. Mm -hmm. or we didn't have a clear process and now we're having to redefine that which i think absolutely. is i think that's healthy that's great yeah absolutely all right so we will go ahead and give it about seven or eight more seconds yep looks like it's kind of slowing down a little bit all right we're going to go ahead and end the poll and i will share those results with everybody so it looks great. like an effective leader is in the lead Woo! there we go there we go. We do want that modeling, right? Absolutely. So this is the reflection part of the, uh, this little workshop. Uh, what insights did I gain? What new strategy should I try? For me, my goal is that you come away with just two things. Just I, That's four, sorry. Two things. Two things that you can implement. Two things you can put in your toolbox. Uh, the Dalai Lama has this really great quote where he talks about uh, one week trying something different. If you want to be an early riser, 
you just set your alarm for 30 minutes earlier for one week. And after that one week, you add something else. And then after that one week, you add something else. And then after a year of that, you're a completely different person. So I don't want us to take 45 things to do differently. I want us to take two, two things that we can modify and tweak in our own lives and in our, our businesses and our companies. And what are those two things you can do that really are going to be something you can try tomorrow? So that would be my goal for the insights. And we have some time for questions. <laughs> All right, so we have about eight more minutes. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and move into the Q&A section. So just as a reminder, if you have any questions for Adam, please feel free to post these in the chat and we will get to them. So Adam, we actually had a couple of questions pop up throughout the presentation. And I know that earlier you had mentioned uh, a, a book title and I'm hoping that you kind of remember which part of the presentation I'm talking about. And if so, would you mind reminding us of what that book title is? And if not, what are your favorite resources or books that you might want to share with people? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to open my chat, but it won't let me open it without stopping the sharing. So that's okay. You just tell me what I need to answer. Um, there is the one of the books I talked about was the uh, Science of Perfect Timing, mm -hmm. which is a really great book. The Science of Perfect Timing is a book that talks about this idea of when is it best to do certain things. I actually did a research on a jury and they gave a jury the same bad evidence in the morning and in the afternoon and they let the person in the morning go 95% um, of the time and they actually found the person in the afternoon guilty 80% of the time and the same evidence wow. there in this research study so it's this idea of when throughout the day is perfect timings to do certain things so I always want my court dates in the morning <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the other book I talked about was Brené Brown's Dare to Lead book. Mm -hmm. um, I find that the vulnerability that we need to navigate right now, I think, mm -hmm. is, is crucial. And so that's a great book. Um, that would be another one. And then I think that was all the only two books I mentioned. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so there's a lot of great resources right now that I would, I would recommend. Um, but yeah, those are two of my favorites. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I've actually read a couple of Brene Brown books as well, and she's got some excellent TED Talks on YouTube, and they're great, like you said, for, you know, bringing up that vulnerable side of us, but it's also really great just as a pick-me-up, you know, since many of us kind of feel down right now. Well, uh, and she, she offers three words that, for me, change anyone's life, and that's when you're talking to your employees, you can just say these three words, tell me more, tell me more. Yeah. And those three words, I think, uh, people will start talking and saying, well, what I mean is, what I mean is, and now you don't just hear the initial question, you hear the root of the question. And for me, that's vital. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like that's a really great way to promote trust within a team as well. I agree. Hit uh, me, so, hit me one. <laughs> so some of our attendees have mentioned in the chat box that their employees just don't feel really motivated right now. And I mean, that could be a result of, you know, the isolation or dealing with multiple distractions or just trying to adjust to this virtual work setting. Um, but as a result, their supervisors are having to start using more micromanaging techniques. And I know that during our presentation, we talked about trying to avoid micromanagement right now. So what would you recommend to leaders and about how they approach this lack of motivation from their employees? I, I guess, you know, what's a good way to try to motivate employees right now? So I'll give you two options. Um, either the lack of motivation is happening because uh, I'm overwhelmed as a parent, I'm stressed, I'm stressed as a worker. And if that's the case, giving them very clear, defined processes of things to do and how you want them done. So literally, it's almost double work for you, unfortunately, as a leader sometimes, but being very like, I need you to do this, and then I need you to do this, and then I need to look like this, and then I, and being very specific, just so that person can actually let their mind rest about trying to be creative or figure out ways to do it, and they can just make sure they're answering what they need to answer. That takes away a little bit of that stress of, hey, figure out this next assignment while they're trying to figure out second grade math, while they're trying to figure out how to navigate the X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. or figure out, you know, Wi-Fi bills right now or whatever. So I think that's one approach is that you can actually, and I wouldn't call that micromanaging. I would call that being extra clear about expectations, extra clear about what you want from them. So you could actually give them that detailed information that can relieve some stress on their end and give you exactly what you want. Or you could also do the other route, which would be uh, figuring out what motivates them. Are they motivated by 
by, by praise? Are they motivated by money? Are they motivated by incentives? What's their motivation? And so we, that takes a little longer to find out and discuss, but that can help work pick up a little bit depending on what they need to be motivated. So, hey, I need this and this is why, or hey, here's a present for you. Here's something I'm just thinking about you, or, or hey, if you meet these goals, this is what you'll get. Um, we're gonna give away a vacation after this. We're gonna give away a weekend stay at this place. So let's all compete and see how we can be motivated to get that because we're all gonna wanna get out of our houses. Um, I'm going to give somebody a dinner at a local restaurant. And so a competition might be a way to break out of that. Those are kind of my two options in my mind that I would use. Um, but that's just me. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And hey, if you're going to be hosting a competition where you're going to send me to a nice restaurant when we're done, I'll join it. I'm, I'm there. I'm in. Listen, people are wanting happy hours more than ever. So it's <laughs> motivation. Exactly. Um, so now one other question that did come through on the chat box was they mentioned that even in person, their employees are pretty quiet. And I know that even on our team at MCOR, we have some pretty quiet, introverted individuals. Um, so how can you engage those employees who are normally quiet in person and how do you engage them in a virtual setting? Well, again, and I think some of it has to do with, I'm trying to get the white out of my face. Uh, some of it has to do with this idea of how are they like to be communicated to? So if you don't know how your staff likes to be communicated to, this is the perfect time to find that out, right? Um, do they prefer emails? Do they prefer, because uh, some people who are introverted have been using emails and, and want to be left alone, and they are thriving right now. They're like, I'm good. Just keep sending me emails. We'll just keep doing this. And their work hasn't changed at all. Right. So if that's the case, then I don't have a problem with that. But finding out, is that healthy for them? Is that the way they want to be communicated to? Emails, texting, phone calls? Because the worst thing you could do for an introvert is call every five minutes, <laughs> right? That's not going to go well. So the same thing is like an extrovert. I get these long, huge emails, and I'm like, I'm not even going to read that. Call me. That's too much information. So it really depends on how they want to be communicated to. But that, that's what I would suggest. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It sounds like, you know, kind of understanding your team, their values, their communication preferences that can make a world of difference with, you know, engaging your employees right now. Oh, especially right now. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think the cool thing too about these things is that, you know, even though we're learning them right now in this virtual setting, these are things that can be applied to, you know, once we quote, go back to normal or once we are able to return to the office. I feel like any kind of information we can gain about our team right now will only help us more in the future too. Well, and let me just give one recommendation, and that would be, I mean, I've given a lot of recommendations, I guess, but, but one important one is taking time to talk to people individually right now. We want to do a lot of like group Zoom meetings right now and a lot of team stuff, but reaching out to people one-on-one -on -one right now is going to be huge because if I'm in a Zoom meeting with, I mean, what, 135 people, I'm not going to uh, ask a question or I may be more likely to be quiet or timid. But talking to them one-on-one and saying, hey, hey, Jesse, what do you think about this? How are you feeling about all this? And showing them personal attention, man, right now that would just send people through the roof. That is a great thing to do right now while we can. Yeah, absolutely. So the last question that we have for you, because I know that we are just about out of time, uh, but the last question, and this is the most important question of the day. Oh, no. What are you watching on Netflix right now, Adam? What am I want? Oh my gosh. It's so there's so many good options. There's Tiger King. I mean, there's so I feel like I have finished Netflix. I finished the whole thing. <laughs> I actually watched Next in Fashion this weekend because I finished all of Netflix and was like, what is this? And I fell in love. I think I want to go buy a, a sewing machine next. I don't know. <laughs> I just love creative things. So I wish I was creative that way, but I'm not. Cool glasses, maybe. Cool clothes, not not quite so much. So. There you go, yeah. So yeah. you keep mentioning these uh, virtual happy hours and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we can hear you do karaoke sometime. The oh, virtual happy hour of our own. <laughs> Everybody would run away for sure. <laughs> I highly doubt that, but um, but I do want to go ahead and you know take this moment to kind of wrap up because I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so everybody, let's give a heartfelt chat box thank you to Adam for facilitating this awesome discussion today. 
So I know that when we first started, we got resounding applause in the chat box. So Adam, I'm not sure if you were able to see that. And right now the thank yous are just pouring in. I think everybody really loved what you had to say today. So thank you. You're I also welcome. want to take this moment to thank our entire MCOR team for putting this presentation together. And then to all of you, our attendees, for coming to our presentation. And in all seriousness, I do also want to take a special moment to thank all of the frontline workers and employees right now. What you're doing for our community is absolutely incredible. And for that, we really sincerely thank you.